but that's that's the story. You know, that that's what we've been been leading to all this time. When he made us new, something began, not ended. Something began in us that is leading to something. And and we all know that. And I think everybody realizes that, not just in the church, not just Christians, but in the world, that it's leading somewhere. And now there are, are a lot of people that have a lot of different views on on what is going to happen. Where is this leading? Where is this going? But but in general, there's a belief that this is one big story. And have you ever heard a story where you got cut off before the end and you're just waiting for, you know, it's it's the... Hollywood has perfected it, right? They're going to leave the cliffhanger. Why? Because they want you to tune in again next week. So at the end of the episode, something's going to happen, and you've got to wait till next week to find out. And you're, you're on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen. You've been there. You've heard that story where it, it hasn't been finished yet, and you're wondering what's going to happen. We have, it's, it's kind of a silly thing, but generally in our house you know we we come home at the end of the day and you know Katie comes home hey how was work what you know what happened today and she'll start telling me about something and and inevitably three little creatures are going to come in and interrupt the story in the middle of it I'm hungry he hit me they're being mean I'm hungry I'm hungry and so I'm you know it's it's you're waiting what what's going to happen next she has a very exciting job, by the way. It's like, we never want the story to go unfinished. We want the story to have an ending, to, to lead to something. And what we're looking at today is the end of the story. Now, we're not to the very, very end yet. We'll do that in a couple weeks. And I'll explain all that in a minute. But we realize in this story, this story that God didn't make us new like we just sang about so that we could live a good life for 80, 90, 100 years on this earth and then that's it. There's more to the story than that. And so we have to realize where this is leading and every other iteration of the story that leads somewhere else leaves out hope and purpose and peace and comfort. But when we have this the end of the story, you know, they always, I don't, do they even have textbooks in school anymore? I don't know if they do, but you know how they used to put the answers in the back of the book? And like, you would just, you know, you're not supposed to look at it, but come on, we all did. You know, you flip to the, or, or even a, a novel, if you're reading a novel, you can flip to the back of the book and see what, what's going to happen in the end. We have that luxury as Christians. We can flip to the back of the book and say, Here's how it's going to end. Here's what's going to happen. And that is what gives us so much hope and peace and so much purpose in our lives is knowing this isn't it. This, this life that we go through where there's so much hurt and so much pain and so much struggle, this isn't it. There's more to the story. And when we come to the topic of the millennium, we, we see God's creation come to what it was supposed to be in the beginning. God created this world and created us, and it was good. And then we messed it all up. And instead of just scrapping it and saying, I'm done with you guys, God set in motion a plan to redeem us, to make us new, to bring us back into a relationship with him so that one day we could experience this earth like he intended it to be. And that's what the millennium really is. It's the end of the story when God shows us what it was supposed to be like in the end. And so that's what we're looking at today, the millennial reign of Christ. Before we get there, though, I want to I do a really, really super fast recap because we've been, we've been on this topic for several months now. We've had some breaks here and there with, with Christmas and other things. 
And so I want to I want to recap just quickly kind of the timeline of events that is taking place in the end times so we understand. But before I do that, let me let me make sure we also understand this as we've said all along. There's about as many interpretations of the end times events as there are people. Everybody has their own different spin on it and and many of those different interpretations have very valid biblical reasons. People can point to this scripture and say, this is why I believe this is going to happen. There, there's a, an element of mystery that God has left in the end times, what we know about it and what we don't know about it. And so we take it by faith and we try to be faithful students of the word and understand as best we can while also understanding we don't fully know. So as I go through this and I share, this is the timeline um, when we get to the end times and we get to the millennial kingdom, don't come find me and be like, you were wrong because you said this. I'm like, just chill. It's okay. How about this? All these things are going to happen. I can say that much. If it doesn't happen in the exact order, then that's okay. But it's all going to happen. So, so here we go, though. This is what we've studied through this series and and kind of how things are going. Right now, we're living in what we call the church age. The age, this time period where God is using the church as his vehicle to bring salvation to the world, to bring the message of redemption to the world. And so from the time of of the, the ascension of Christ to the time of the rapture that we're in this period of what we call the church age, where Israel is still God's chosen people, but for the time God has set them aside and is using the church as his instrument to bring redemption to the world. And so we're living in this this undefined period of time. We don't know how long it's going to last because the next event on the calendar is the rapture, which Jesus says only the Father knows when that's going to happen. So we don't know when it's going to happen, but it is a a point in time where Jesus will come and rapture or catch up, not not catch up like that, catch up his church to be with him where all the believers on the earth that that are there will be taken away to heaven for the duration of the tribulation, which is the next period this on the timeline, this seven-year period of judgment and wrath. We studied it in depth. I think we took four or five weeks to go through the things that are going to happen. To sum it up, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be horrible in every sense of the word, but during this time, the church will not be present. We are, according to scripture, we are spared from the wrath to come. However, During that time, as we discussed, there will be people that come to faith that are living on this earth during that time. So there will be new people that come to faith during that time. At some point in there, before Jesus returns, a couple things are going to happen. One is the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's in Revelation 19 if you want to read about it. The, The marriage ceremony, if you will, where Jesus and his bride, the church, are going to be united together in heaven and be a time when when we will receive these fine linens white and pure we're going to be united with our husband jesus forever he says in verse 9 blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb so we see that picture we get these white robes and then we we return with jesus wearing those white robes also at some point the timeline is a little unclear but at some point Possibly during that time before Jesus returns will be the the judgment seat of Christ. Did you know it's not just going to be the unbelievers that have to stand before the throne? We're going to do that too. Now, it's not going to be to to weigh our good against our bad and say, oh, you know, your your bad outweighed your good. You don't get to go to heaven. No, it's it's to, to reward us but to, to judge our actions. This is what, what Scripture says, Romans 14. is why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 
if that doesn't give you like some a little bit of chills, like stand before God and give an account of ourselves to him. Mm. But again, that's not to judge whether we get to have eternal life or not. If we have trusted, by, trusted in Jesus by faith, then that's done. He's given us the Holy Spirit as a, a guarantee. But we're still going to stand before him and give an account. And so what we understand, though, is the resurrection of the saints happens at the rapture. But the resurrection of those who don't believe does not happen till the end of the millennium. So this judgment that we're talking about is only for those who are believers, who will be rewarded for what they've done, and then there will be a judgment later for those who don't believe, which we're going to look at next week. And so we have this happening, and then after the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, we discussed it a few weeks ago, Jesus is going to return, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, he's going to defeat all those who stand against him, he's going to defeat the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then he's going to establish his millennial kingdom. And that's where we're at today. The millennial kingdom. And, and we're going to look, you know, we can't get into all the details. But just to give you a, a sneak peek, next week we're going to look at the final two pieces, which are the great white throne judgment. That's the one I was talking about, where unbelievers are going to be judged. And then a new heaven and new earth. So the question then is, if God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, why didn't he just do it? Why do we have to go through this millennial thing where we're on the earth? And why, why not just wipe it away and start new? Well, there's good reason for that. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. But this millennial reign is going to see, we're going to see Jesus who has returned on the throne, on this earth, As John said, we will be in his presence. We'll be worshiping him, not not like we have been, but face to face. I don't know. I don't know about you. That that's pretty exciting to me. I think that's going to be pretty awesome to worship Jesus face to face. So turn in your Bibles, Revelation chapter twenty, almost at the very very end. Revelation chapter twenty. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is the the description of the millennium. Bonus points in here if you can answer the question of how long the millennium asks, lasts, okay? See if, if there's any clues in the scripture that tell us how long it's going to last, all right? Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection." Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. All right, so the first point today, the timing of the millennium. How long is it going to last? Right? If you count verse, we didn't read verse 7, but if you count verse 7 six times in the first seven verses of chapter 20, it literally says a thousand years. And if you want to get really technical with it and look up the Greek words, it means a thousand years. Literally a thousand years. That's it. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of ways that people interpret this, and many interpret this to be figurative. Many believe that we're living in the millennium right now, that it's a, an undefined period, um, that there's not a, a literal millennium 
But what we see in Scripture, if we're going to interpret Scripture literally, which I prefer to do, because the more of me that gets into the interpretation of Scripture, the more trouble we get. So as, if, if I can, if at all possible, I'm going to interpret it as literally as I can. And so when it says a thousand years, six times in seven verses, I'm going to just assume it means a thousand years. So, so very simply, we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but very simply, the, the timing of the millennium is 1,000 literal years on this earth where Jesus is reigning on his throne. So he will, he will enter in the second coming, he will come back, and he's going to establish this kingdom that's going to last for a millennium, for 1,000 years. So the, the bigger questions, though, then... Secondly, are who, who are the inhabitants of the millennium? Who's going to be there? Are we going to be there? Is grandma going to be there? Who's going to be in, in the millennial kingdom? And so very simply to answer that, those who enter the kingdom are be everyone who has been saved by grace through faith in Jesus. All believers will be present for this. When the rapture happens, all the, the living believers are caught up to be with Jesus in, for that seven-year period, and then we return with him during the second coming. All the believers who were saved and died during this church age, it says during the rapture, they will be raised. And then at the second coming, all the believers from before that church age and all the believers who died during the tribulation are going to be resurrected. So all believers from all time are going to be there to enter into the millennial kingdom. So when Jesus institutes this kingdom, all the believers will be there, but there will be others who are present. And so what happens to them? There will be some who live through the tribulation who did not believe, who make it to the end when Jesus comes back. What's going to happen to them? Well, for that we turn to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus shares this. You'll notice if you look through your Bible, there's, there's a lot of parables in this section, and some people say this is another parable. Uh, this does not have the language of a parable. You know, a parable, when Jesus shares a parable, he will say the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of heaven is like this, and, and describes it in that way. He doesn't say that here. This is a literal prophecy of what's going to happen when Jesus comes. Here's what he says, Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. When the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then, verse 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
So clearly we see at the establishment of the millennial kingdom, Jesus sits on his throne. There will be more than just believers at that point. And Jesus will divide them, sheep on the right, goats on the left. Those who believe will be permitted to enter. Those who do not will be cast out into eternal punishment. What Jesus says here, you could almost interpret it to mean if we do these good things, we get to go to heaven. If we feed hungry people and we clothe naked people and we visit sick people and we visit prisoners, then we get to go to heaven. But what he's saying instead is the ability to do those things comes through the Holy Spirit working through us. It comes through a relationship with Jesus. If you're here on Wednesday night, we talked about this a little bit, the fact that our works done under our own power are worthless. When, when we abide in Christ, he, his power flows through us and we're able to do things, we're able to produce fruit, we're able to do good works. And so when Jesus says this, he's not saying, do these things and then you get to go to heaven. He's saying, follow me and then you're going to do these things because my life is flowing through you. And so those who believe enter into this millennial kingdom, those who don't believe don't. They get ejected into eternal punishment. Believers from all ages, resurrected with glorified bodies. Believers who are saved during the tribulation will also enter the kingdom in their natural bodies. And those who don't believe will be cast out. Now this does mean during the millennial reign as we said, people from the tribulation that believed will enter into the kingdom in their natural bodies. They will have kids. A thousand years. I didn't do the math, but I imagine there'll be a few kids born in a thousand years. So during this period, there will be people who will not follow Christ. As crazy as that sounds, with Jesus literally on the earth, sitting on a throne, there will still be people that will not follow him that will not trust in him by faith. This is why there will still be, and we'll look at this next week, at the end of the thousand years, uh, one last rebellion. It's not going to last very long, but one last rebellion as Satan is released and those on the earth who don't believe will, will try one last time and fail miserably. So the inhabitants of the kingdom, very simply, are all believers from all time. So then the question is, what is the world going to be like? If it's on this earth, what's it going to be like? Well, one thing uh, that, that I didn't put in the notes, but that we should understand is as we studied the second coming, things are going to change topographically. You know, the Mount of Olives is going to be split in two. Things are going to be different on the earth. But that's not the point. What I want to look at is what is the world going to be like? Not physically, but spiritually and otherwise, what is it going to be like? And the first thing we see is that Jesus will rule as king. He will rule with a rod of iron. Okay, so you've, you've experienced maybe firsthand, maybe secondhand, maybe thirdhand, you've experienced uh, the Justice Department in, in our country, or you've seen it in other countries. Uh, sometimes things drag on for a long time. Sometimes an innocent person is found guilty. Sometimes a guilty person is let go. None of that's going to happen because the judge is Jesus. He will rule with a rod of iron. And because of that, you know, while there still will be, because again, there will be people born during this time who don't trust in Christ, so there will still be sin, the judgment will be swift and decisive and carried out by Jesus himself. Jeremiah 23, 5 it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. He will execute justice. He will be the one to handle it, and he will rule with a rod of iron. It says that in Revelation 19, 15. He's coming back with this two-edged sword coming out of his mouth to defeat his enemies. And then once he's back, he sits on his throne and he's got his rod of iron. And he's going to rule with that. 
So while there will be some amount, of, a very small amount, but some amount of sin and disobedience during that time, it will be dealt with swiftly and decisively by Jesus himself. Secondly, we know that Jerusalem will be the center of, of this new uh, kingdom. Jesus will sit on the throne. If you look through scripture, you see Jerusalem also called Zion. This is where the center of the kingdom will be. Isaiah 33, 20 says, Behold Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an untroubled habitation, an immovable tent whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. Think about that for a second. If you, if you know anything about Scripture, if you've studied Scripture at all, you know that Jer even right now, Jerusalem has been in flux, if you will, for centuries upon centuries. There, there are still fights over the city and who, who should be, you know, where should the capital be and all this stuff. Over the centuries, this, it's been destroyed and it's been rebuilt and different nations have come in and taken over or dragged people out. Look at this though, Isaiah 33, it will be untroubled and immovable. That's what happens when Jesus sits on the throne. Uh, and, and I'll add, add this in just so we understand. That, that applies to us too. That applies to the, the millennial kingdom when he's literally sitting on the throne. But when Jesus is on the throne of your life, you're immovable. You're untroubled. I'm not saying you won't have any trouble. I'm not saying life's going to be perfect. But he's in control untroubled and immovable. Stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. That can be you if you trust in Jesus. So Jerusalem's the center of this new kingdom and peace and prosperity will reign. We, we read this a, a few weeks back. Isaiah chapter two, Verse 4 says, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Micah 4 3 says essentially the same thing, reiterates that point. Imagine a world where all the nations take all their weapons and make them into tools for farming. That's what the world will be like. Peace will reign. There will be no war. There will be no fighting. Yes, there will be some disobedience. But because Jesus is on the throne, he's going to deal with that swiftly, as we said. There will be peace during this time. And there will be not just peace between people and peace between nations, but peace in general. Look, some of the things that Scripture talks about, Isaiah 11, has the wolf and the lamb... The leopard and the young goat, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear, they're all going to just kind of hang out together. Can you imagine going to the zoo and having those animals in the same enclosure together? It prob you probably wouldn't want to take your kids to see that. It says in Scripture that lions will graze like an ox. Can you imagine a lion walking around eating grass? You've seen the videos on TV of lions chasing down their prey. Instead, they're going to walk around and eat grass. It tells us in Scripture that a, a child can, will play over the den of a cobra, will stick their hand near an adder and not be bitten. There will be peace, not just between people, not just between nations, but between people and God's creation. Things will be like they were meant to be. This was how creation was intended but not just peace, there will be prosperity. And, and when I say prosperity, I don't mean everybody's just gonna have you know, cash falling out of their pockets. Everybody's gonna be rich. But instead, prosperity meaning everyone's gonna have plenty. There's not gonna be people going hungry. Isaiah 30, 23 says, He will give rain for the seed with which you sow the ground and bread the produce of the ground, which will be rich and plenteous. And that day your livestock will graze in large pastures. The crops will be plentiful. 
there won't be a season where we say, "Uh uh-oh, we're running low on this, or there's a drought, we need to, to ration this or that. There will be plenty. Amos chapter 9, 13 and 14 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed, and the, and the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. The crops will be so plentiful that the mountains will drip with wine from the vineyards. That's what the world will be like. Everyone will have what they need. No one will go hungry or thirsty. And in addition to that, we will have health and long life. Now, we know... During this time, sickness and disease and and ailments and poor health in general will will be gone. For those who enter the kingdom with a glorified body, we won't have to deal with that. But there will be some that that still have their natural body. Isaiah 33 says that the inhabitants of the kingdom will not say, I am sick. Can you imagine that? Especially considering what we've been living through for the last few years. Can you imagine a world where, where nobody would say, I'm sick? Sorry, I can't be there today. I'm sick. That's gone. Isaiah 35 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. This was fulfilled in part by Jesus and his healing ministry. He came and did these things. But in full, this will be fulfilled when Jesus comes in power and sits on his throne. When it won't just be that one person that was healed, but all the people, all the deaf people, all the lame, all the blind, when Jesus establishes his kingdom. And so that, again, you may ask, why, why is there death? I thought death was arrested. Isn't that what the song said? Well, again, you're right. He defeated death, but those who enter the kingdom in their natural bodies may experience death. It's kind of unclear how this is going to work. If somebody is saved during that time, do they you know, immediately change into a glorified body? We don't know exactly how that's going to be, but we do know that there will be some that will experience death. But even those, it's going to be more like it was pre-flood, right? You remember after the flood and God says, I'm cutting you guys off at, at 120. You're so corrupt and so evil that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit the number of your days. Isaiah 65, 20 says, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So a young person will be a hundred if that gives you any indication. So health and long life. The world during the millennial reign will be more like it should have been when God created it. When God created the earth and all the people and all the animals and everything, that's how it should have been. Of course, we messed it up, but now he's going to restore the way it should have been. So then the final question that we're looking at today is what is the purpose of this? Because again, why wouldn't God just say, I'm done with, you know, with this earth. If he's going to create a new heaven and earth, why not just do it now? Why not just do it when Jesus returns? Why do we need this thousand year period? And I'm glad you asked. Those are good questions. Basically, to put it very simply, God made promises and God keeps his promises. Every single promise that he makes, he keeps. And he made promises that he can only keep in a literal kingdom with a literal king. That's why we have the millennium. Again, it's, it's to, to finish the story of this creation. And we, we do that by something that happens here on this earth. So he promised a lot of things, but specifically I just want to look at two. And the first is the promise of land. 
In the Abrahamic covenant, God promised a lot of things. Many of them were fulfilled in Jesus. He said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to, through you, the whole world will be blessed, he told Abraham. And that happened in Jesus. But he promised other things. He promised land. I'm going to give you this land. Genesis 15, he says, uh, 18 through 20, he says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That land, if you, you know, if, if, you know, smart people have, have done the work on this, if you map it all out, Israel has never possessed all of that land. Even under, under the rule of David and Solomon, uh, and later Jeroboam had a, you know, probably as big as those guys, at its height, the kingdom of Israel never possessed all the land that God said they were going to possess. And so in order to fulfill the covenant that God made with Israel, in order to fulfill the promise, he has to give them the land he promised them. And he's going to do that. Not only will they dwell in that land, they will be blessed and prosper in it, just like he promised them. This is Deuteronomy chapter 30. It says, When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you, and you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your father's. When you obey the voice of the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, you will dwell in the land, you will prosper in the land more than any generation before you, you will prosper, you will multiply, God will bring the people back. He said, even those who are in the furthest parts of heaven, he will bring back to dwell in the land that he promised them. In order for God to fulfill this promise, this needs to happen here on this earth in a literal kingdom that he establishes. So he's fulfilling the promise of land, but he's also fulfilling the promise of a king. In the Davidic covenant, God promised Israel to have a king to sit on the throne of David forever. Here's what he said, 2 Samuel 7 Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This promise is fulfilled when Jesus returns to sit on the throne of David over his millennial kingdom in a very literal sense. There are a lot of other promises, including in the New Testament, there are a lot of promises that are fulfilled in the millennium. In order for them to be truly fulfilled, it has to be a literal kingdom on this earth. That's why God can't just say, I'm done with this, I'm going to bring in the new, because he has promises to fulfill, and God keeps his promises. 
every single one of them, he keeps his promises. In the millennium, God is is completing his redemptive plan. It is from the creation to the millennial kingdom. When the millennial kingdom's over, this creation will be gone and he'll, he'll bring about a new creation. But this is the end of the story of this earth, of this creation that he's made. No more cliffhangers. No more waiting for the end of the story, wondering what's gonna happen next because Jesus will be on his throne. This is our hope. This is our peace. This is our purpose. Next week, we're going to look at at the end of the millennium, what comes next, and the the defeat of Satan, the final judgment, all that stuff. But before we do that, I want us to understand this. The end of the story is, it's real. It's going to happen. And I, I, I wish that I could say exactly when, but we don't know. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And I want us to understand this. For those of us in this room, those of us, those that are watching online today, to understand when that time comes, when Jesus sits in judgment, when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, there's no more opportunities. If you die before that day comes, there are no more chances for us to trust Jesus by faith. So the the question I would have for you is, if Jesus came today and sat down right here and said, I'm going to start dividing people up, are you going to be on his right or his left? That's a real that's a real question that we have to ponder. Or or are we going to be the people that say, "Well, I did this and I did this. I went to church every Sunday and I read my Bible and I, you know, I was a good person and I didn't do this and this and this." And he's going to say, "I never knew you." I pray that that's not the case. If Jesus were here separating the sheep and the goats, would you be on his right or on his left? Think about that question, but also think about those who you love, people that you know and love. Where would they be? Would they be on his right or on his left? Or do you you not know? Let's make a commitment today to understand this stuff is going to happen. This is real. Where do you stand with Jesus? Where do those that you love stand with Jesus? Do they know him? Have they trusted in him for salvation? I hope they have. I hope you have. The, God's word demands that we, we respond, that we do something. It's not meant to just be heard. I'm not just up here to, to teach you fun facts about what the Bible says, but to to teach us something that is going to help move us forward in our relationship with Christ, to draw us closer to him and to draw others closer to him. So I want to challenge you today as we close out, think about that. And as, as we sing this last song and we have our response time, this area is going to be open for you to come and pray. I want to, I want to ask you to pr- come and pray. Maybe today for yourself, you say, I don't know where I'm at. I'm lost, I'm confused, come and pray. I'm gonna sit right over here, come and, come and pray with me. But also I wanna invite you to come and pray for that person, because you know what? I'm pretty sure most people in this room, when I said that, you, a name or a face popped into your head, and you know there's somebody that needs to hear. I want you to come and pray for that person that God would give you the opportunity to share with them the hope that we have in Jesus. The fact that there's an end to the story and it's a glorious and beautiful end for those who believe in Jesus. It is a wonderful and perfect ending to the story. It's not what the world tries to tell us is gonna happen at the end. It's beautiful and perfect for those who believe. Come and pray for them. 
Come and cry out to God for that person. That he would give you the courage to talk to them. That he would open their hearts to hear what you have to say and respond to the gospel. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that you've shown us the end of the story and what an end it is. You haven't left a cliffhanger. You haven't let us waiting and wondering what's going to happen, but you've shown us exactly what you have planned. And that plan is you sitting on the throne with your people worshiping, giving you praise, living in the world as you intended it to be. And Lord, I pray that you would move our hearts to go and tell others about the hope that is in Jesus alone. That you would move our hearts and burden our hearts to go and share the hope of the gospel to those who need to hear. To those that we know today, if Jesus were standing here dividing the sheep and the goats, we know where they would be and it wouldn't be in your millennial kingdom. It wouldn't be around your throne worshiping. Give us the courage to go and tell them about our hope that's in you and you alone. God, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this story that you have created. You could have scrapped it from the beginning. When sin entered the world, you could have ended it right then and you would have been justified in doing it and you would have been just as righteous and glorious but for some reason, you wanted us. You wanted a relationship with us. You wanted to be with us for eternity. And so you made a way. You wrote the story, and you will end the story. And the story's all about you. But in your infinite wisdom and glory, you have made us a part of that story. Help us to find our place in this story and help us to lead others to find their place in your story. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.